welcome to Koinonia. Here at Great Bridge United Methodist Church, we welcome online and in-person community, lively spiritual conversation, and personal study and reflection so that we may give our hearts and our lives to God in order to transform the world and see to it that no one misses out on the grace of God. We know that the Word of God draws us closer to one another, and that the study of God's Word is essential to our Christian walk. So let's open up our browsers and our Bibles and receive God's Word to us today. Once again, good morning, everyone. We are in week four of our sermon series called Sent, and I want to uh, read to you today from the Gospel of John, the 20th chapter, verses 24 through 31. And, and the Gospel of John is really where we find uh, kind of the, the most of the, the resurrection stories of Jesus. John 20, 24 through 31, these words might sound quite familiar to you. But Thomas, sometimes called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples told him, we saw the master. But he said, unless I see the nail holes in his hands, put my finger in the nail holes and stick my hand in his side, I won't believe it. Eight days later, his disciples were again in the room. This time, Thomas was with them. Jesus came through the locked doors, stood among them, and said, Peace to you. Then he focused his attention on Thomas. Take your finger and examine my hands. Take your hand and stick it in my side. Don't be unbelieving. Believe. Thomas said, My master, my God. And Jesus said, So you believe because you've seen with your own eyes even better blessings are in store for those who believe without seeing. Jesus provided far more God-revealing signs than are written in this book. These are written down so that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and in the act of believing, have real and eternal life in the way that he personally revealed it. My friends, this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, friends, how many here have heard about Chat GPT? Chat GPT, it's uh, the newest technological craze with artificial intelligence programming. Programming that will write essays, newsletter or magazine articles, books, term papers, doctoral theses, and yes, even sermons. Sermons. <laughs> Sounds so interesting, doesn't it? Right? I can remember the, the pre-chat and GPT times when I, I stared at a computer screen. How many people have ever had to do that? Right? Just hoping, just hoping. Fingers on the keys, just waiting for that inspiration from that, that first key stroke. Waiting and waiting. Oh, here it comes. Nope, not there. Not there. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Here we go. Wait, 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 wait. No, sorry, nothing there, nothing there. And after a result of some of those times, I, I would then go back and I reread the scripture, move my, my neck from side to side, and then I'd take my, my fingers and kind of scrunch them all together like this, getting them ready for speed typing session. Because ready or not, here we go. The human engineered sermon. I think it's fair to say that after nearly 10 years together, we can both admit that I have put together quite a number of those human-grade sermons, have we not? Right? And you've heard more than your fair share. 
In fact, I believe that St. Peter is going to let many of you just walk right on in to the eternal kingdom. Saying something like this with Paul standing next to his side. Oh, let that one in. They listen to far too many Tim Craig sermons. They get to go in free. There he goes. See, Paul? Just free. Kind of like your sermons, Paul. Free. Just come right on in. If only, if only it was that easy both for getting into heaven and for writing sermons, except now we have that chat GPT, and it's easy. AI. AI will write a sermon for you or at least help you. All you have to do is type in or to speak the following. I'm going to make sure, uh, Aaron, yeah, we we do. We have the, the chat on, so... Um, we can do this. All you have to do is the following. You have to say something like this up into the iCloud. Uh, sermon. I need a sermon, please, on John 20, 24 through 31. And it's got to be about doubting Thomas. Doubting Thomas. And it needs to be about 15 minutes in length. The people of Great Bridge, they get a little antsy. It's 16. 15 minutes in, in length. It needs to be something funny at the start. And then, chat GP, it needs to have a strong closing with a challenge at the end that will get us ready for communion. Oh, and don't forget, don't forget that it also has to be part of a sermon series about sin. So it has to have sin somewhere in the theme. Enter, enter. Now, can you see the words just appearing on the screen, right? Just going right across. Thomas, sometimes called the twin, would you like for me to talk about the controversy with his name? Wow, sure, AI. What controversy? The name Thomas in Hebrew means twin. In fact, in the Gospels, Thomas is often called Didymus, which in Greek means twin, too. He was a twin, but we don't know who his twin was. Although, there is modern scholarship that suggests that Thomas was the twin brother of Jesus and... Uh, wait just a minute, AI. Jesus didn't have a twin brother. You were the one who asked about the controversy. Uh, okay, okay, I did. But that's not where I want to go with this sermon. I, I, I know about some of that crazy modern scholarship out there on the, the Gnostic Gospel of Thomas. It's so very different, and it's not the accepted canon known as the Bible. So let's do this. Let's just stick to the Bible, please. AI, in addition to this passage, is Thomas found anywhere else in the scriptures? Yes, he is. In the Synoptic Gospels, Thomas is listed as one of the twelve. He does not speak at all in these Gospels. However, in John's Gospel, Thomas has three speaking parts. Wow, that's not only interesting, but that's a lot. Can, can you tell me where he speaks? Yes, I can. <laughs> AI, uh, AI we're, we're waiting. Oh, do you want me to tell you where he speaks? Who's the intelligent one now? <laughs> yes, AI, I do. I heard that comment. Thomas speaks up in a pivotal story found in John 11. The rest of the disciples do not want to go anywhere near Jerusalem. Bethany, where they are being summoned to go because Jesus' friend Lazarus is sick. Bethany is near Jerusalem. And the disciples are afraid that they will be arrested and crucified. Thomas speaks up and says to the group, let us go to Jerusalem and die with Jesus. He was quite brave in this story. The disciples all go because of his encouragement. And there they experience the resurrection of Jesus' friend Lazarus from the grave. Wow, wow. That's, that's a side of Thomas that seems quite contradicting to his nickname, Doubting Thomas. Excuse me. He is never referred to as Doubting Thomas anywhere in the Gospels. Who is the intelligent one now? He, he, he. Uh, thanks for that, AI. I, I, guess, I guess I deserve it. You, you said there are three places where Thomas is mentioned. John 20, our passage that we've been studying, and then also John 11, which you just cited. What's the other? John 14. Jesus says to the disciples, Do not let your hearts be troubled. 
believe in God and believe in me. In my father's house, there are many rooms and you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas speaks up and says, Lord, we do not know where you are going. So how can we know the way? Jesus says in reply, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This statement and thought needs to be kept in your mind as you try to understand the John 20 passage. Do you understand? I guess that is why I'm here, and I guess also that's why you, the congregation, are here. We have, we have come to know Jesus as the way. We understand that he speaks the truth and that he is the truth for a world in need of truth. And we believe that he is the life. Although, I think for many of us, we have a twin as well. We have a strong desire to, to follow Jesus. There are times where we may even have a, a strong voice to go along with that desire. Something along the lines of, let us go to and die with Jesus. But we also have other desires that pull on us. Desires to know it all, to test the boundaries, to sometimes be absent from the room. Isn't it an interesting detail that Thomas was absent from the rest of the disciples just days after the resurrection? Thomas, a supporter of going to, to Bethany with Jesus just chapters before, and an encourager of the disciples to, to stick together as a group and, and indeed to, to follow, to be those courageous followers and supporters of Jesus and for Jesus. Well, when we encounter Thomas in chapter 20, he's been alone. Alone with his grief. Alone in his suffering. And this is why AI may not be able to give the whole story. Maybe a human understanding is needed. No offense to you, AI. None taken. I want to hear more. How do you say it? How do you say it has been on my heart all week? We know what the... We know what this passage looks like written down in black and white on paper in a book, a Bible, on a page, or even on a computer screen. But what did it sound like? What does it sound like for us today? Maybe if it sounded like defiantly, right? It sounds like this. If it's defiant, it sounds like that. Unless I see the nail holes in his hands and put my finger into those nail holes and take my hand and put it into his side... I will not believe. Perhaps toning it down a little bit more, yet still on the defiant tone. Right? It may sound something like this where there's a twinge of grief. Unless I see the nail hole. And put my finger into those holes. And take my hand and put it into a sigh. I will not believe. And, th and then there is this. What if these words were said in wanting to believe? Tears of, of shock and grief falling. From Thomas's eyes. Even consider this a suppression of voices. Voices that were saying things like this to Thomas You don't know the way. Because if you did know the way, Jesus would have come to you. You're not good enough, Thomas, to be a disciple of Jesus. Jesus never appeared to you. What if all these things were in play in Thomas's mind, things affecting his heart and his faith? 
After all, Thomas was human. What if his words sounded like this? May I try? Of course, AI. I was all alone. I was all alone when he came to you. I was grieving and my heart was broken. I'd do anything just to see him again. You got to see him, but I didn't. Unless I see the nails, the nail holes in his hands and put my finger in the nail holes and stick my hand in his side. I just won't believe. I've purposely tried to put together a sermon today that, that doesn't take this passage all the way to the end. I've done so because when we go all to the way to the end, even in the scripture passage, it, it seems to, to wrap it up so nicely. Thomas believes Jesus may have scolded him just a little bit, but the story just wraps up. Just wraps up so nicely. In fact, you know, I thought about even doing a, a second sermon, a second sermon entitled, How Did Jesus Say It? How did Jesus say it? That might come someday. But just stay with me now here. Think, think about what it means to be human and what communion community that knows Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life should look like. Notice in our Bible passage that the disciples didn't throw Thomas out with his words. They didn't say, Thomas, we have seen the Lord. We have seen the Lord and you didn't. You must be inferior. There must be something wrong with you. We all saw him, but you didn't. They didn't say to Thomas after he exclaimed, they didn't say, your unbelief is not welcome here, Thomas. Get out. Quite the contrary. The scriptures say that they welcomed him in. And this too is what it means to be sent into the world by Jesus. And while Thomas was with them, a room full of believers and a doubter. And Jesus came in and said, peace to you. Don't be unbelieving. Believe. Amen. I just want to see you move 